Hi, this is Lawrence Feldman, and I'm here to continue with some of the playing experiences that I've gleaned over the years in my career, playing with a lot of singers and recordings and all sorts of gigs. And what I'm going to do today is try to demonstrate in a rapid way various styles and even some different equipment that may be specialty equipment for special situations. Hello, I was just doing a little breath exercise that helps me um, chill out a little bit and sometimes it's good to calm the mind before one plays. <clears throat> Especially in my case, I tend to be a little uh, humorous and sometimes laughing your head off, laughter is the best medicine, but sometimes if you're laughing within seconds of playing, I don't think that's uh, necessarily good. Okay, today we're going to... I'm going to try to rapidly go through some of the various types of uh, styles that one may run into as a saxophone doubler. And I'm going to start with the tenor. <clears throat> and um, I'll talk a little about equipment and so forth. Well, here's something already that just came up I didn't plan to say. If I'm playing alto and tenor on the same gig, which uh, is not easy, by the way, conceptually, I use two straps I, because it gets confusing getting the right length for each saxophone. So that's just a small thing. Okay, here's some tenor. Um, okay, so tenor... So uh, I, for me, auto link metal mouthpieces are kind of the the standard sound for jazz tenor. It has been for a long time. I personally feel they are the closest to the human voice, which is why I like them. There are some players that are uncomfortable on metal links, and that's fine. I I, I love some players with rubber mouthpiece. Another thing is that. Metal mouthpieces are not necessarily brighter, especially on tenor, than rubber. They're, they they have a, just a different overtone structure and something about the way the note starts. Another thing about equipment is uh, my friend Bob Malik said, he said, you know, man, years ago, all the cats played one tenor mouthpiece and everyone sounded different. They all played the same kind of mouthpiece, namely Otto Link. And it was true, 90% did, and they all sounded different. He said, today there's 100 tenor mouthpieces that people play and everyone sounds the same. Slight exaggeration, but there is some uh, point to that. And the thing with an auto link is it does allow for various types of styles and approaches. Maybe I'll Im imitate it. In my mind, for, since I grew up loving early Coltrane's tone, that's sort of, I don't know, my default average, I'd say average sound. So it might be something like this. <laughs> That's kind of a pleasant sound that sort of my basic idea of a sound. I alter it for section, I might alter it for certainly for rock and roll. That's one of the kind of tones I like on tenor. Um, I don't know, I'll just play an imaginary section part, a, a very generic section part with a variation of that tone. Let's see. <laughs> Sort of a basic sound that blends uh, well enough. Oh, I would say in a section, to be an ultimate blender, I might use a rubber mouthpiece, but definitely don't have to. Okay, just randomly going to a funk style. I definitely can play uh, rock and funk and on, on a metal link, and many people do. I'll just try to see if something comes out. <laughs> A 
that sort of thing. Let's see. Um, okay, later I'm going to show you if I'm doing a real vintage rock gig, like, say, Chubby Checker era, 50s. <clears throat> I use a different mouthpiece, if I can. That just sounds a little more like the old R&B solos, in my opinion. Then there's like sort of modern funk, guys like Andy Snitzer, or there's like a pop ballad sound that's kind of nice. Um, if you're going to think, think of something like that. Oh, but that's the kind of sound. Um, and to me, that sounds good on an auto link. Okay, then there's like uh, a whole ballad sound for an auto link that's good. I'll, I'll try to think of something nice. Uh, so also link if, if you know how to do it now in the I've said in a different part of this video about, for me, playing the different styles, I have to, um, the way I do it is not that technical as far as changing my embouchure. It's more like <clears throat> I have to get in a mindset of how these different styles or particular artists make, make me feel emotionally. And in, in my case, so somehow that triggers the oral memory, but more than the oral memory, it's like it's almost like an acting role. I said, where I feel a little bit like not not that I'm gonna be Stan Getz or Coltrane, but but I'm gonna be in the mood that I would feel when I was younger when I heard their records. And um, since I'm working so fast here, I don't feel I'm giving myself enough time to really get in the kind of uh, almost trance or hypnosis of, of that person, but this is just a practical quick run through. Okay, another beautiful sound is Stan Getz. Um, <clears throat> and what I, I've always loved Stan Getz very much, and what I've found in my experience is that when you play him with a singer or behind a singer in a ballad especially, even though you don't hear too many guys playing the Stan Getz style, it's really uh, appreciated by the singers very much. They, they may not even know it's a Stan Getz type of tone, but they just know it makes them feel kind of relaxed. Uh, okay, so let's say uh, playing with a singer and they're singing like a Burt Bacharach tune like Look of Love, and then the tenor has to play the melody, so maybe if I think a minute. <laughs> That was wrong, by the way. That inflection was not Getz. That's more like culture. Okay, now I'm, I'm playing this soft. I'm hearing I'm a little sharp, so I'm pulling out. I'm going to do a little more Getz. Another gets cliche that's really nice in the key, let's say in our key of G. A real typical gets thing from all his years, a lot in the Bas Novas and before that, he'll often play that flat nine in a very romantic uh, way, like. <laughs> That's a sort of a standard gets emotion and tone. Okay. What I'm going to do is <clears throat> put the reed up. 
to make it a little rounder sound, see, and we'll all together see if that's more gets like. It, what it is is a fake way of making the reed harder. <laughs> Yeah, so to me, say I was on a record date and I wanted to play like it, <clears throat> like Stan Getz, after a moment I would see, hmm, it's a little buzzy for Stan Getz. So what I did is I, I just moved the reed really high up, I don't know, like a, almost a full eighth of an inch past the mouthpiece <clears throat> because I don't have time to get a harder reed. Gene Ammons, I recommend, listen to Gene Ammons, listen to Gene Ammons. I would even call him the missing link in the tenor playing I hear today from people under 40. Um, just, just listen to Gene Ammons as a stylist, as a jazz player, feeling, time, everything. So my workaday imitation of Gene Ammons, just, it's just a more honking kind of sound, like he may play something like... <laughs> That, that sort of thing, a lot of the uh, alternate fingerings and really barking. It's like you can really bark into that. If anyone wants to know exactly what that is, to take it up another time. Or call Ed Joppy, who knows all these things. Okay, okay I'm going to show you a special situation, which since rock and roll is a, is a large part of uh, what gigs have been and probably still are, here I have a much more open mouthpiece, a Berg Larson, <clears throat> much more open and much softer reed. Hopefully it'll fit on here. Now this is loud and it gives me a headache really, so I don't, I don't practice on it, but let's see, I'll just get used to it for a second. <laughs> See, I'm already getting a headache, but... Okay, so this kind of mouthpiece, uh, well, certainly for... Uh, it's loud, and so if I'm playing with a bar band, which I occasionally do, I can hear myself against all that noise. But it, the thing is, it's got a little more of a... I, I would, what I call it, a less sophisticated tone which kind of fits the uh, simpler feeling of rock and roll. It, you could even say sort of a ignorance. That ex not a, I mean, I like R&B a lot, but compared to jazz, it's, it's, it's a more ignorant, and I'm using ignorant in a good way. So here I am in the key of A for tenor. That's another thing, if you don't know it, a lot of rock tunes are in the so-called guitar keys which means the open strings, key, concert A, concert E, concert G. And uh, the funny thing is, although those are difficult keys to play bebop in, they're, they sound good and they're kind of easy to play rock and roll in for some reason, I don't know. And they sound good. Like I like the key of F sharp on the horn, which is E major, very common rock key. In rock, you would play more pentatonic and just basic major triads and stuff, so it's, it's not such a big deal to play in those hard keys in rock. If you want to play Cherokee in F sharp, it's a different thing. Okay, so this would be uh, an A major kind of thing. A one, two, A on the horn. <laughs> Then there's B, 
Brecker thing, which actually I would use, but he does this bending thing. <laughs> Um, okay, one more thing, like. Another thing is uh, rock tenor playing really, to me, comes out of guitar playing, and there's a lot of nuance where you put that minor major third in, the, in rock blues. <clears throat> Same in jazz, but there's a lot of, there's, there's probably a hundred places you can put the, the third, and, uh, each one has its own slot, and I, and I think that's an important sensitivity that separates the, the rock players, certainly like Junior Walker and King Curtis, Tom Scott. They may do it different every time. Like, here's going to be three, uh, sorry, five, three, one, typical blues lick, The actually the melody of Shotgun, but here, here's one way. Sometimes it can be surprisingly close to the major third and still sound very bluesy. What you don't want in a, an A7 chord, you don't want a, a true minor third doesn't sound funky enough, which would sound something like this. That's good for A minor, but for A7, I like to hear kind of an in-between. Where it almost scoops up to the... Uh, major third. That's a guitaristic thing, but it's a subtlety that I think unconsciously people hear it and, and it sounds more like a real R&B guy. An interesting thing is that to me good R&B tenor is almost an imitation of guitar and good jazz guitar is almost an imitation of good jazz tenor playing. There's, there's some relationship I've observed. Uh, okay, another thing I could do with this mouthpiece Sometimes there's like, uh, like say in the studio, a part, like, like an old 50s rock and roll. And you just get a part like this. So to me, this is a dumber sound than the link. And I think the dumber sound sounds more authentic so somehow. Um, and, and I like that. Another thing is uh, one of the great, great stylists and jazz player, Plaz Johnson, on a million recordings. I, uh, um, I had the experience of not a good, touring with Linda Ronstadt shortly after Plaz Johnson didn't want to go on the road, and they were, Linda Ronson was doing ballads with full orchestra, Nelson Riddle, and um, that was, that, and when I listened to the way Plas played it, even my appreciation of Plas went up even more. But uh, for commercial solos on a record, sometimes this is a nice kind of thing, like. <laughs> Um, definitely not as good as Plaz, but um, I'm working fast here, and you, you see it's a different kind of sound, and it, sometimes it just, the, the big thing is it's easier to play a, a low kind of subtone than it is on, a little easier for me than on the link. It's like a friendly sound, not not as saxophonistic. So the, all that is the result of a more open mouthpiece that's soft to read. Okay, on to the alto now. Blow some warm air in it. I think I mentioned it earlier, but just simply, yes, the alto is harder than the clarinet. What do I mean by harder? Uh, sorry, harder than the tenor sax. I'm so sorry. I meant alto is much harder than tenor. If you don't, uh, just to cut to the chase, in my experience, there's 15 or 20 good-sounding tenor players, just professional-level good-sounding 
for every one good sounding alto player, that's my personal opinion. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the alto is harder, probably because it's in a woman's voice, just like bad violin playing will upset someone more than bad cello playing. It's less forgiving. Um, call me at 496-1132 if you want to know more, but that's my strong opinion. Uh, just a comparison with the tenor requires a little different armature, but for me the big thing is like I have to switch gears in my brain. It's, it's like I have to be a whole different person for the alto. It's actually the hardest thing for uh, doubling for me is play alto and tenor on the same gig. It's even harder than playing say alto and clarinet or, or saxophone and flute possibly because it, I have to feel like a different guy. So I will try to become an alto guy while, while I warm up here. To me, I'm not there yet. Yeah, I could tell I was just playing tenor for 10 minutes. So I'm going to warm up a little more. So for alto, uh, just slightly, maybe uh, the lip held in a drop more than tenor, perhaps, depends on your face and the way you play, and a little more concentrated airstream. I think of the alto as being an instrument that broadcasts, broadcasts, and has penetration. The tenor, I think of it as more... Uh, trying to maybe hug the audience or the listener a little bit more. Alto, I think, is more penetrating, although it doesn't have to be, but... And I also think alto is possibly... A, um, tenor is more of the earth, earthy, you could say masculine tenor. Alto is uh, more feminine. I used to pr practice along for tone with uh, Dinah Washington records, just try to sound, catch some of her tone and vibe. And uh, alto is probably more feminine, let's say, but certainly not always. Okay, general general alto tone. Uh, it depends on how old you are, what era, but for me still, the general alto tone is sort of a, I hate to say it, but sort of a generic-sized, generic version of the bebop tone, which would be uh, typically bird, uh, stit, although stit is maybe, is de well, too penetrating, but one of my favorite tones in the history of alto. Uh, bird, um, cannonball, Phil Woods, that would be what is maybe expected as your default alto sound, it w which, uh, but everyone has their little personal take on it. <laughs> Uh, oh, here's an alto thing, which I give to my students and I believe in. Alto can also have like a sort of a humorous thing. And it, in, a, in a way, it's, I don't know, more optimistic, hopeful than the tenor. This is all my abstract thinking. So I give students these little happy, almost cartoonish melodies to play. And I feel it gets you in the alto mood. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, like, uh, like a song like the following. Hold on, my reed's a little crooked. Okay, so I like, I give, my, I tell my students as part of the warm up, play like a happy tune and then hopefully in many keys. Something like this. TV themes, um, even um, uh, little nursery rhyme things. I, I have a few. Oh, yeah. I like this one. Just to get the alto kind of buoyancy. The alto has to have a lot of buoyancy, not, not a sinking, heavy feeling. Uh, 
And even things that are humorous uh, seems to help me on the alto. And that I got a lot from the great George Young, great saxophonist and studio player. He would often play little cartoony things. And I, for some reason that helps me get, get in the alto mood. One of the things. Okay, so a little general section sound. <laughs> I'm just making up some silly stuff, but that, that's kind of a, I would call that middle of the road alto sound. Now times have changed so much. I had a student come around 10 years ago. It's a long time ago. And what I tell students first time is say, just, just have one standard ready to play. That's all you need. Maybe one medium tempo, one ballad. Usually one ballad gives me an idea of. So the guy, I said, what, what? On the phone, he said, like something like Misty. I said, yeah, just like Misty. So he came in, and this, this was a wake-up call about how much times have changed on uh, styles and what, what young people listen to. So I said, okay, Misty, and this, this is the way he played it. Um, I'm getting confused in the keys. Oh, yeah. This is how he played it. I'll do the whole business. He went like this. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't even that good, but in other words, his history of the saxophone started with Sanborn. And, you know, I had to go to myself, whew, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to blow his whole thing, but uh, then gradually I explained to him about Johnny Hodges and Cannonball. And, you know, in other words, for that guy, that was middle of the road how he would play a ballad. Whatever. To me, a typical, if you have a certain rock rhythm section and, and the rhythm is different, perhaps you can play that song, but for me, that would definitely not be normal alto playing. Um, we're going to get to the funky type of alto that sometimes I've had to play in the studio. I also like to put in a little bit of legit alto sometimes to warm up, which is very close to old-fashioned jazz, like... Um, like something like Harlem Nocturne, very stylized, like either the original, I think it was a British guy, then there's the famous, um, ooh, the guy that Coltrane played, Earl Bostick's version, fantastic. But anyway, that kind of slurpy alto I think is good. I also warm up on, and definitely have had to play many times on gigs and recording. I've even had to play written out Johnny Hodges solos, but let's see what happens with that right now. Uh, so that's a whole other kind of alto style that would be what i'd call like a las vegas version of johnny hodges johnny hodges is a lot more subtle but it's that slurpy thing and um, a lot of richness and overtones and that's one of the beautiful things the alto can do. W one of the warm-ups, uh, of course, Cannonball, I think uh, another educational alto thing is to listen to the albums in the 50s, I think it's the 50s, um, Cannonball with strings. All, all those ballads are, are just... Uh, He's really playing from the heart, and he's got a fat singing sound. Um, so some, I used to play along with those records, and sometimes I'll try to play in that style, which is a touch of Hodges and Benny Carter for sure in there, along with his love of bird and bebop. But he, he had a different sound. It's not really in the, it's not exactly the, what I call the, the penetrating alto sounds, a little tenorish almost, but many people's favorite and warm. Uh, there's a solo he did with the 
um, Basa Rio Sextet on Quiet Nights that I always love. So sometimes I use that to just loosen up on the alto and he plays something like this. And the beginning of that solo, I remember I learned, was something like this. Exactly right, but there's a real slick uh, two five thrown in there, and um, I use uh, anyway. But but that sort of fluffy sound and low right there. It's that sort of a cannonballish thing, and um, that's also maybe even a better default uh, average alto sound for studio work and all that stuff. Um, I've actually played a lot of lead alto in bands, a lot of TV shows, Grammy Awards, Tony Awards, and one time played the lead alto book Thad Jones, Mel Lewis band when he was there, but I subbed a lot on the band on second alto. Okay, so general lead alto. For the older style, my personal favorite is Marshall Royal. I think he gets the most color, the most, you know, oomph and just feels it. The funny thing is that kind of old alto sound is not that different than classical, but it's got a whole different attitude to it. Um, Marshall Royal, I would recommend. Um, let's see, a Thad and Mel thing. Now, if that was an older bassy chart, uh, I would let's say that was a bit more vibrato. But for Thad and Mel, somewhere just to me, maybe not much more vibrato than that. It depends a lot on the way it's voiced in the saxophone section, the era. Let's take a melody like that in an older style. <laughs> towards a bassy-ish or a contemporary record date. That was the kind of style I think I used on a recent Tony Bennett duets record where I played lead alto on a few cuts. So, something like that, because it seemed to call for that. One, one other thing, because I think there might be a lot of college students out there, and you may know of the Bob Mincer big band. And I've been, I'm a charter member, actually, and on almost all the CDs I played the lead alto chair. And just want to mention, that's a little special situation because he does not write a uh, traditional sax section. It's, he's more orchestral. And I'll just say that in his music, I almost never use any vibrato at all, except one album that he did tribute to Basie, which won a Grammy. Um, and in that, I did. But still not as much as if it was a real Count Basie chart because he, he uses the saxophone much more orchestrally. I think it's important on alto to find your own approach to playing ballads. I think uh, playing ballads slowly in many keys is as good as any tone exercise. Um, lately, I've been liking the key of B on the alto, D concert. So here's something I enjoy. <laughs> trying to put in some of the harmony notes like bridge I think 
good balance. There's, there's certain tunes that are real alto tunes. I'll just name them quick because of the register or the feeling. What's new? Um, I like the tune Alfie. Um, here's that rainy day. Um, might as well be spring, but beautiful. Great alto tune. And I must mention, by, by far the best but beautiful alto I've ever heard is Charles McPherson. I've listened to a lot of versions of it, and it's, it's deep for tone and for the improv. I'll mention that. Okay, now we have the art whole rock contemporary thing, which is different. I generally do it in, in studio work on my main Meyer right here, which is a Meyer 5. And let's see, um, let's see, you have a rock pot. <laughs> Okay, most rock is a little more sophisticated than that in the studios, but that's the kind of sound I can get on the Meyer. So, th so therefore, on this Meyer, I can get from like. <laughs> or more classical. And then turn right around with a thing in my head and go like. Okay, now here's something interesting. We're gonna go into rock. That, to me, I use the high F sharp Sanborn thing as a test to see if my read is hard enough. This happens to be a soft read, so right in front of you, I'm gonna clip it to cure the uh, people who are afraid of clipping reads. And let's see if it's true. I find that if I can't do the high F sharp split thing, this is personal, then the read might be too soft. So I think this might be interesting to see how this works. See, okay, so I needed a little more read to do that. Uh, by the way, that's a mannerism now. In the old days, Cannonball and other people, it would come out by accident, like on an E minor 9. Um, now it's become a, a mannerism. Okay, so Sanborn style. Um, I'm going to show you if I'm really on a rock gig in a club or want to sound more authentic for r and I'm going to show you the, just a little bit about setup. Here I have a Brillhart metal. I feel that it allows me to go further into that style, providing the read is okay. Let's see. One more thing, alto, Paul Desmond style, very overlooked, gorgeous. Um, to me, Paul Desmond, lighter tone. I can do it on my Meyer, but it goes a little further with this Gregory, which is the mouthpiece Paul Desmond actually used. I, I, I think of his tone as an icy blue. Uh, people call it a dry martini. To me, it's a feeling of a carefree, I call it a leisure tone, if that means anything. I have a lot of mental analogy. Well, let's see what I can do here. This puts me in the more of in the acting role, this setup. I can do it on my Meyer, I've done it, but this goes another degree for a very light sound. Okay, that's just an example of extreme style. I love that style. Again, you'll be surprised with singers. They will react very favorably to that style. Okay, one more thing, clarinet. I'm going to try to show the difference between jazz and uh, legit clarinet. Legit meaning the kind of legit we have to play in studio work, general movies, Broadway usually. Okay, here's just a quick basic clarinet tone that I have. OK, 
Okay, my reed dried out a little bit. Basic, uh, unwarmed up classical sound. Now what I'm going to show you is, even with this very close mouthpiece that's not an aggressive sound, what I'm doing is putting on one mi millimeter shorter barrel, which allows me to loosen up, not changing the mouthpiece, to loosen up and not be flat. So, and not sound flat, that is. So what I say is, for jazz blowing, you can use the same mouthpiece, just one millimeter or two millimeter short barrel. Um, and, and let's see if this works. Now, if I tried to play that way on my longer barrel, I, I, it would sound flat because I'm too loose. Okay, that's a quick clarinet thing. I also have a special mouthpiece that's really for big band, but I rarely use it. Thanks for watching this. I hope some of these miscellaneous tips you'll find useful in one way or another. Thank you.